The next presenter is obviously our own Maxim Lamagoyos Saint Ilea. Max is a visiting assistant professor in archaeology in the anthropology department of Davidson College. He received his PhD from Tulane University and his MA from Trent University. Max has a keen interest for cross cultural comparisons in archaeology and is most fascinated by how ancient governments worked. Specifically, he studies the structure of classic Maya royal courts as evidenced uh, by their regal palaces. And Max is the co-organizer of the Maya del Lago and obviously Maya de Playa conference. He's also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Mayanist that we heard about and the president of the board of directors of the Boundary and Archaeology Research Center. Max's talk is titled today, Breaking Tamal, Commensality and Politics Among the, the Ancient Maya, in which he explores the act of eating a meal with others as a bonding sociopolitical force among the, all segments of Maya society. And he discusses what evidence is there for ancient Maya commensality beyond the archaeological records, such as broken pots and butchered bones. Please welcome Maxim Lamoy Saint Hilaire. Thank you, Hari, um, for the nice introduction. I should point out that I recently uh, became not the president of the Boundary and Archaeology Research Center. I need to edit that in my bio. Uh, this is, um, so uh, this is not something I do anymore, but uh, an amazing place nonetheless and a great group of scholars. Um, all right, so uh, let me share my screen here once again. Okay, so my talk is entitled um, Breaking Tamal. Uh, let, I need to, I can't even read the title. Um, hide. Okay. Breaking Tamal, Mensality and Politics Among the Ancient Maya. Um, I kind of crafted this talk for uh, the general public and it's a little different than most of the talks that I've been giving recently, if any of the people uh, in the audience have been watching the stuff I've been talking about, but uh, I hope uh, you appreciate it. And so, Commensality is um, a pretty simple concept, really. It's the fact of sharing a table uh, or a meal in the company of others. There's this, this com common term uh, uh, in, in English, uh, which is to, to break bread uh, with one another, which obviously has old roots, um, bread being the ultimate staple in uh, Western uh, Europe uh, since a very long time. Um, but one thing that I kind of want to bring here to the table is, is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is how um, can we best think about, um, about commensality, right? What do we remember most about meals? Uh, so that, that, that's a question that I often think about um, because as we investigate ancient foodways, and it's, it's hard for us to really kind of project ourselves in the past to really think about what was going on in these moments. Uh, we don't necessarily or very rarely uh, are able to sort of target specific moments, synchronic moments in the past. Uh, you know, uh, as uh, uh, Richard McNally has, has, has coined the term, uh, there's the, the, the lens of, of archaeology are kind of telescopic. We don't, we see things from afar. We have a hard time really kind of getting down to the, the event. But if you think about important meals in your life, what do you remember most about it? Um, do you uh, remember um, the dishes? Uh, do you remember the forks, uh, the spoons, the knives uh, that you were using? Perhaps you remember some of them, perhaps extremely uh, important meals you've had uh, were the dishes and, and the utensils were, were particularly noteworthy. Um, maybe uh, they were uh, introduced to you uh, as a special uh, set of china that a family only uses for rare occasions, perhaps on Christmas or for weddings and so on. But I, I bet you that most people here aren't able to recall um, exactly what uh, were the eating implements that were associated with their meals, with that meal. Interestingly, those eating implements are the things that we archaeologists find. Um, therefore, we kind of tend to give an, a lot of importance to those. Um, and then, of course, there's more to the 
to the pot than just the pot. Uh, we can learn a lot from the pot, especially um, based on its context and so on. But it remains um, not probably the most important of the meal, uh, I think. Do we remember most of the ingredients that were associated with the meals? Do we remember that um, this sauce was amazing uh, because uh, the basil uh, was incorporated and it was partially fresh? Or do we remember um, that uh, the uh, salad had really nice uh, glazed pecans? Maybe. Uh, in particular, I'm sure people who have backgrounds in, in, in cuisine uh, or perhaps and work in restaurants or have simply uh, perfection, perfected the art of, of cooking in their life might be a little more interested in these kinds of, of, of questions. However, uh, it's unlikely that uh, these are the most important uh, things that people remember about meals. I just remembered, realized that I have shorts behind. I'm going to remove them. Um, so that said, uh, ingredients are extremely important. And Today, we have incredible access to all kinds of ingredients, but ingredients were not as um, diverse in the recent past in the, the lives of our parents or our grandparents. Uh, one thing is sure is that in ancient classic or post-classic or pre-classic times, uh, the variety of ingredients was a lot um, more local. Uh, maybe there was a lot more creativity in using local ingredients. But if there were some new ingredients that were available through long trade and um, or, or someone coming back from the uh, a trip and bringing back some dried fish or something, that would have been quite noteworthy um, to people eating it for sure. Maybe so that's something we're maybe, maybe a little jaded about uh, having access to passion fruit in Quebec, uh, Quebec City in the middle of February and such things, obviously. Now, of course, one thing we tend to remember about meals is if the meal was absolutely amazing, uh, if the, the, the flavors were, were really great, if a specific uh, chicken uh, w w tasted fabulous because it had been um, brined uh, for, uh, for days in, uh, in, in Tabasco and salt and transformed into delicious um, chicken, fried chicken to include in a chicken salad at Commander's Palace, for example, here I'm thinking about specific uh, chicken I ate that was very good. Um, Commander's Palace, great classic in New Orleans. If you have had the opportunity to, to go, uh, you should. Yet um, a lot of meals, we can recall vaguely the meals or we can recall the meal itself, but we may not recall the exact, um, how, how things tasted. It's possible, I think for a lot of people. Maybe some of us remember uh, the kind of uh, beverage we had during uh, those meals because they were partially delicious, such as uh, delicious coffee, right? Um, uh, or something else. That would be fantastic. If someone is particularly interested in these matters, of course, they will stand um, more importantly. Do we remember the company of the people uh, we were eating with? Um, I do. That's certainly something that I recall very well. I recall, uh, often I recall where I was sitting in relationship to other people, who I was sitting across from, who I was sitting next to me. If the, uh, the conversation was uh, interesting, I will remember it. If it was not interesting, I probably won't remember it. Or I may not remember the person. I'll remember less. I'm the, this per weird person that will remember details about people, but not their names, uh, which is, well, has, has drawn a lot of flack in my life. Uh, but then I don't remember their names, but I remember lots of details. So it ends up uh, balancing out. Emotions is certainly something we remember uh, uh, for meals. If, if, if it was an awful meal because it was awkward, uh, you will probably uh, maybe decide to forget about that meal. Um, but if it was a good time, if you fell in love uh, during a meal, if uh, you, you, you had a great laughter, um, uh, if you had a good times, you will probably recall it. But I think emotions, of course, uh, as most people have realized now in their lives, emotions are highly tied to memory, of course. So um, uh, important uh, emotional uh, uh, changes are related to uh, how well we remember some things, for example, crazy things that happened in our life when we were little kids we remember well. Well, that goes along with meals. There are certain um, things that we remember about meals, of course, like specific uh, aspects of conversations. That often, interestingly to me, occurs when I will remember a piece of information before I remember the meal, and I'll try to think, where did I hear that? Or where, where did I learn that? And automatically, I find myself back into this commensal moment. 
where I recall specifically the first the information that was catered to me during this meal. Uh, and then I uh, remember the person who I was chatting with, and then I remember the meal itself uh, or the restaurant or the space where we were, of course. Uh, remembering specific elements of the conversation. There are factors that can mitigate uh, remembering specific elements of the conversation. Like if you're drinking a lot of coffee uh, during a meal, that can affect what you remember or not. But um, commensality is a basic concept. However, uh, it is kind of important, right? Eating food and drinking stuff, beverages, is what uh, makes us people. Uh, food is, is remarkably interesting as a topic because it is at the center of life. And so is beverage. And uh, it's fun, right? Drinking and eating with friends is really fun. And maybe we realize that even more so now during a pandemic, when we've kind of lost touch with people, we may speak with them on the phone, we may text, we may do Zoom, we may even do Zoom meals. Um, and we've all tried that. We probably stopped doing that by now because we're tired of it. Uh, but we, I really lost, uh, I feel like I don't know my friends as well as I used to because we've stopped hanging out uh, as much. Uh, looking at you, Matt. Uh, no, uh, just kidding. The, uh, the, the point though is that Commensality is perhaps the most important aspect of, of our social lives in some ways. Uh, and of course, I, I'm not, I don't want to sound crazy, but I think that that's something that we can extend beyond our societies of, of, of the modern world. In fact, I think that in a time where there would have been a lot less things to do, going to the movie theaters or, or um, that were social, that is, um, of course, there's all kinds of things to do at all time, especially when it's creative and in tune with nature. Um, but I think that uh, as social events, uh, commensal events, perhaps at even more importance, uh, and if one reads ancient literature, uh, meals and gifts giving during meals tends to, to be a very prominent of, of part of the literature. And so um, it's a simple complex, but it, its potential is immense uh, and, and to drawing into all kinds of, of information. It, importantly, commensality has an enormous potential for gathering large groups of people in the same place. Um, and that's kind of a, one of the main points of, of what I want to talk about today. So one of the kinds of, of, of unique uh, commensal events that, that, that have been very important in the literature and anthropology and archaeology, of course, is feasts. Uh, I'll talk about feasts for a little bit. They're hard, they've had, they have multiple kinds of definitions, multiple kinds of categories, which is not something I'm gonna talk about today. I could, I could really delve into the feasting literature uh, and, and, and introduce all kinds of interesting and fascinating concepts uh, with you. Some of which um, have been uh, um, um, proposed by multiple authors over, over the last decades. Uh, some of which have been criticized. The, even the concept of using um, or applying categories to feasts or classifying feasts into specific hard categories has been criticized recently by uh, Catherine Twist in particular. Um, but one thing that is clear is that all feasts and most commensal events, not just large feasts, have strong political undertones or even overtones at times. Just think about uh, daily family meals uh, where um, people sit a specific uh, place at the table and um, specific rules apply to who can speak when or how you can speak. And if you break those, uh, you, uh, you, you may become uh, get, get, get in trouble with, with parents and so on. Topics you shouldn't talk about at a table. It's all political. And, and basically um, there's a decent amount of literature also on how family drama, family politics are really kind of, uh, they're all attached to commensal events. And so Catherine Twist um, writes that feasting is thus both deeply and inherently political. Feasts are not the only meals where people affirm or negotiate authority and influence. However, all meals have political implications, following Harstorf. Um, some meals overly acknowledge power and status distinctions, royal feasts, for example, and some do not, but politics pervade them all. Great book, The Archaeology of Food. Use it in one of my classes called Ancient Foodways. And so um, we think of feasts um, as, as fun events, uh, but of course, there's always a little bit of drama that can uh, occur at feasts. Uh, we all, we see this photo um, that is extremely cheesy, uh, but at the same time, 
and, and we feel like it's cheesy, but we also crave these moments. We all want to be part of groups of people getting together, enjoying food, enjoying company and good uh, coffee. And so, uh, and then there are these other kinds of fees that are entirely uh, beyond um, what we are used to that, that, that just include immense amounts of food uh, and kind of celebrate uh, the diversity of foods offering that are offered um, and um, also waste in some ways that can be kind of emphasized during feasts that uh, if you can afford to, to not only present all this food, you can even waste some, uh, which kind of is important. And I'm not really getting here into the entire notions of, of um, using feasts for negotiating power or amassing power. Uh, that's just not what I'm delving into today. I'm just kind of trying to provide a different perspective in feasts. Feasts are celebrated in literature in all languages uh, and have been represented in a lot of medieval uh, iconography. Uh, and I really love uh, feasting scenes uh, from Western medieval Europe uh, that are always kind of interesting and they always involve a lot of intrigue uh, and back in the backdrops you always see uh, games and entertainment happening. I think they, they're very, uh, of course, the, this kind of theme has been heavily uh, used uh, in the people creating movies about these topics. Um, one can think of, of fake um, medieval things like Game of Thrones, uh, where, where feasting events are extremely political. Um, uh, it's a red wedding, I think, one of, one of the really important uh, moments, turning points in the first or second season. Um, now, in addition to feasts, um, I think there's a small, uh, is this, this is a small thing that a lot of uh, authors have kind of forgotten about uh, when talking about feasts. There's this important distinction to be made between what, 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 I, what I hear I call fairs, um, where the distinction between inclusive communal fetes and competitive diacritical feasts was clearly recognized um, by people who studied um, or people who interacted with the Maya in the post classic period, such as uh, the infamous Bishop Diego de Landa. Presumably, this dichotomy extended back into the classic period, for throughout this large period of time, the Maya were organized into competing states. The concept of diacritical feasts, I'm, I said I wasn't going to go deep into the different categories of feasts, but the concept of diacritical is, is interesting. What diacritical means is it, it, it is there to create contrasts. Um, so a diacritical feast is a feast where a segment of society is basically included and a segment is excluded. And as such, it defines uh, by the terms of engagement, a community of interaction and uh, in an inner political circle, if you will, uh, as opposed to a large communal fete uh, where the kind of, um, um, that, that, would, that we can picture in our minds when we imagine large plaza full of Maya people celebrating um, a festival or uh, uh, an annual uh, cycle uh, renewal and so on that would also involve uh, large performances on temple pyramids and so on. I think there, those, those are two different concepts we have to keep in mind. Um, and so they're not the same thing. And also the kind of food that would have been served at those would have been very different, uh, being produced in vastly different quantities. Um, importantly as well, one thing that is important to keep in mind is that feasting appears to have been widespread across social groups and not confined to the elite class. Both commoner and elite lineages head, lineage heads were expected to host festivals or feasts that mark group members' rites of passages and commemorated imported ancestors. And so um, it's not just the royals that had feasts. Um, any uh, person familiar with uh, settlement archaeology knows that there's all kinds of uh, large uh, plod, um, plodzuelas or courtyard groups associated with all kinds of segments of the society that would have been perfectly fit for hosting these kinds of events. And in fact, I, I, I'm pretty convinced that feasts uh, were a predominant, predominant uh, strategy for uh, literally articulating the different um, segments of, of classic and any other uh, ancient Maya society, or uh, segments of society. And so, uh, here we have a beautiful illustration from Tom Hall of National Geographic uh, describing um, a, a ball game um, slash festival at uh, the site of Copan as seen from the very top of the Acropolis uh, with a uh, Maya king drinking cacao uh, with uh, two um, royal ladies also sitting next to him on a mat and also drinking cacao in these uh, famous vessels. 
cylindrical polychrome vessels uh, that would have been perhaps labeled with their names and with a kind of, 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 of beverage that was included in it. Uh, and so in this sense, we see here uh, both these concepts I was just describing in, included uh, with this massive uh, a fair going on uh, where no doubt some food would have been served. We see these kind of tents uh, up in the distance where we can imagine this food might have been distributed or even sold, although uh, that's a whole different topic. I would think more distributed. Um, and then uh, here we have a diacritical kind of situation where only a small select portion of the, of, of the entire uh, community uh, that is unifying itself here is allowed to, to drink probably the kinds of beverages that aren't sold at the bottom. Uh, so this is kind of the, 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 this, this distinction that I'm, I'm meant to, to make. And then there's these um, extremely famous uh, photographs uh, made, uh, designed by Jocelyn Kerr of palatial scenes predominantly that are portrayed on uh, early and but mostly late classic vessels and terminal classic vessels uh, from um, the lowlands uh, predominantly, but also the highlands of, of the Maya world. And these are often used uh, to describe Maya feasts. Uh, they're tricky though, because you often, you, you often see food represented them uh, as uh, Mark Zender was pointing out, we see tamales with sauce on them here and there, different kinds and different uh, types of vessels. We see here a frothy uh, chocolate beverage as well. Uh, and this always makes, this is a, a pillow or a codex, but it, it looks like a big hamburger, but it, that's, that's not a hamburger. Uh, and then, um, so then, then you see also here a lady holding another large vessel, which certainly contains uh, something to drink, probably a, a chocolate-based um, Beverage. However, they're they're not really feasts. Uh, what they are is, is 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 small snippets of what palatial life might have been. The architecture helps us understand where they are, but uh, typically they're in throne rooms. Uh, so they're very small gatherings, very private settings. So different kinds of of, of commensal events, if you will. Feast might not be the right term uh, for these specific scenes, although these uh, events can occur at the same time as feasts for sure. So feasting is a hot topic, which is kind of funny because for the casual observer, it might be surprising. Why are people arguing over feasts? Uh, why is it just not uh, logical because we have evidence of it in the ethnographic record and the ethno-historical record everywhere in the world, in our society, uh, obviously feasts were common. However, um, it's hard um, to argue sometimes for feasts in the archeological record. Uh, anthropological archeologists tend to uh, uh, disagree uh, about what is a feast and what is not. Uh, it's just one of those kind of um, interpret uh, interpretational uh, difference um, that can be uh, that can actually uh, create some pretty hot debates. Recently, in a conference that I was involved with, um, uh, the, uh, with the organized um, by Marilyn Masson and um, uh, Patricia McEnany for the Modern Oaks, uh, the, the Pre-Columbian Symposium, the the Feasts were referred to as the F word of, uh, of archaeology. Um, here, showing a little bit how they shouldn't, the word shouldn't be mentioned sometimes, uh, kind of highlighting how people are, have grown wary of using this term. Uh, one of the main reasons is that there's a lot of challenges in identifying isolated events. There are some evidence, uh, for example, uh, Carolyn Paris working at La Corona, working on, on on the Chultun, which is this un an under chamber, an underground uh, a chamber that was um, uh, capped after a, a, a long event and was used to uh, deposit a lot of refuse or trash uh, of a bunch of vessels that all kind of connect together and all kinds of material, uh, macrobotanical and, and funnel seems to represent one massive event of consumption and perhaps highlighting one feast that occurred. And that, that, that kind of context is amazing. Um, Hai Miawe and Julie Hoggart and other people working at Kahal Petch on the superficial deposits there have also identified um, probably successive events of, of something that resembles feasting and can argue for with good basis of, of individual feasting events and such things. And this is possible. And as methods in archaeology and, um, and lots of people are putting their heads together, we're, we're getting to a place where we can think about this really well. However, it's still challenging in general. To, it's pretty unusual to be able to say, ha I've identified one feast and here is my argument for it. Um, 
this also leads kind of to, to a corollary uh, issue, which is what I ran into um, doing my research, which is challenges in separating daily sustenance from feast. If uh, you work in a household context, um, uh, you uh, may uh, just uh, you may need to uh, work pretty hard to excavate a large midden, uh, a large amount of trash, which could actually uh, relate to decades, if not centuries of occupation. These kinds of large middens uh, are pretty famous or pretty amazing sources of information, but they are commingled. Their the ancient Maya went back in these middens to scoop stuff out, to use as construction fill, a true recycling. Um, they, uh, they use these, the, the, these spaces to dump lots of all kinds of stuff resulting from all kinds of activities throughout time. It's hard to say, well, um, here in this small section, I've found uh, remnants of, uh, of a feast. Or it's hard to say this section was used for them to dump the, the, the remains from feasts or the, 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 the refuse from feasts. And this is where they dump the refuse for their daily sustenance. It's impossible is it, to do that. So um, there, this brings kind of this other similar kind of issue. But um, beyond eating, um, of course, consumption of meals is the most enjoyable part of, of, of a commensal event of commensality. We, 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 we don't uh, f uh, fawn over uh, the, 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 the washing the dishes after uh, the party we hosted at our house. Yet, uh, there's a lot more activities for me at all. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it probably means you're not very good uh, as a guest because, um, or as a host, <laughs> because there's a lot that goes into hosting, uh, uh, not even a feast, even just a meal, a uh, special meal for, for friends. So of course you need to acquire and transport ingredients and that's not talking about growing them or, or going to buy them. Um, uh, you need to store and cook those ingredients in specific ways. Often it's easy to uh, mess that up. You need to serve the meals need to clean up and discard uh, all the material that's not reusable um, uh, or the, the leftovers or you can compost them or whatever. Uh, also disclosure, uh, I worked in restaurants for seven years. So uh, that's one of the reasons I'm fascinated about this stuff. And I kind of uh, um, worked in all parts of the restaurant. So I'm familiar with these steps very well. So I also love hosting meals and look forward to this pandemic ending. Uh, you can also think about um, the other side, all uh, right? the kind of maitre d' dimension uh, where you need to invite the guests uh, to uh, the event and select guests, of course. You need to devise the hosting plan. What are we going to do? What's the step involved? What's the menu? Uh, you need to execute it, which can be uh, even harder. Um, and you need to cope with the unexpected guests not showing up, uh, extra guests showing up, um, guests puking on the table, uh, these kinds of things that happen when uh, you host a feast which can, of course, uh, 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 um, make things more complicated. So when we study ancient Maya commensality, of course, I mentioned earlier, commensality is the act of sharing a meal. Uh, it becomes a little tricky because the nature of archaeological evidence makes it much easier to detect the production, the, pre prepar the, sorry, the preparation, the storage, and the discard of the food uh, than it is of uh, detecting its service or consumption. Uh, so these steps here uh, are definitely the, the easier one to detect archaeologically. Yet uh, the assumption that the prepared food or the discarded remain the, uh, the discarded refuse or the food that was associated with the start, discarded refuse was eaten is most likely correct. There is very unlikely that the Maya were just cooking a bunch of food that they weren't eating. Um, perhaps unless a part was given uh, to uh, as, as, as an homage uh, to uh, gods or ancestors or so on and destroyed. Uh, yet uh, the vast majority of the food that was prepared was definitely eaten. Okay, so we know that. It's a, it's a pretty solid assumption. Now, studying ancient Mayak mentality is tricky because, of course, food does not preserve um, uh, the actual pieces that are edible, um, either become edible at are eaten and then um, disposed of in, in ways that you're familiar with and uh, which facilitates their, their, their transfer in, into organic uh, soil uh, or are just put in a midden uh, behind a, a house or behind a household group or behind a, a palace. Uh, and then it's hard to find any uh, remains of it. Um, you can uh, using specific techniques. We'll hear a little bit about those techniques from, uh, from uh, Clarissa Cagnato tomorrow. 
but um, and then and probably from Shanti uh, today. Uh, but there, there, there's a whole dimension to the to the, um, the, the the food remains that is attainable, but it's not easy. Now, perhaps our best evidence for eating uh, comes from uh, the uh, iconography and epigraphy. So, of course, uh, the famous uh, Chikna murals of Kalak Mul that, uh, again, we've said this exact image in uh, Mark Zender's talk, uh, but also on polychrome vessels show us a lot of this uh, eating happening. Um, we also have specific, of course, we've just heard about that from Mark Zender, uh, hieroglyphic, uh, hieroglyphics that show us the different uh, elements involved in eating, such as the meals that are eaten, even perhaps the concepts of a meal or a feast that's been tentatively identified uh, by House and Stewart in 2001 here um, and other authors before. And then there are the obvious uh, uh, archeological evidence, the artifacts, uh, the ceramics and the lithics that are uh, that, 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 we, that we get to study. We even know the names that ancient Maya used for them. We know what they were used from. I mean, some are used for eating drier foods and some are used for eating wetter foods or serving or cooking or preparing or and so on. Uh, this is a, just a, a drawing that I made of a really cool um, uh, composite brazier that I get to excavate um, during my master's work with colleagues uh, as part of the social archaeology research program working in the suburbs of Milanha in Belize. Um, uh, this was this. This is a, a three-prong brazier, which would, you would have built up, uh, uh, put coal here, and then the, uh, there's holes at the top that do this indirect cooking of whatever is inside this this lidded vessel. It, these were all found together on a, a really cool termination offering, um, and, and, a, and an elite, well, not an elite, a sub-elite, or not at all actually. A, Commoners, the head of, a, of the lineage of a commoner household in the suburbs of, of, of the Minanha, the agricultural suburbs. So we, we see these all these vessels that can be very informative on the eating dimension, but of course, beyond that in preparation and so on. We have obviously ceramics and lithics as well, the lithics uh, being used for cooking and also eating and cutting, and butchering and so on. And uh, the, perhaps the, the most obvious element of the food we eat that is left is what is not really edible. That is the bones of the animals that are eaten. In this case, uh, this is a full skeleton of a, of, of a dog that I probably wasn't eaten. It's, it's, a, it's a wrong image to put. It's just really cool. And that's from uh, excavations at uh, La Corona. So that said, um, Jeffrey Pilcher uh, has put it well uh, in his conclusion to the volume, Her Cup of Sweet Cacao, it is by Tracy Arden that just came out. Um, we, by saying temples, palaces, and courtyards through their architectural design and ornamentation leave the most obvious evidence of feasting in the archaeological record. Although even here, careful interpretation is needed to discern the social meanings of commensality. It should be mentioned that uh, Dr. Pilcher is a food historian, not an archaeologist. Uh, and so he, it's easy to say that uh, for him. However, um, saying this is always a little trickier for archaeologists who may not believe that simply with architectural evidence, you have good evidence for things like feasting. Um, so how can we go, uh, how can we get uh, from cooking um, to eating in the archeological record? Um, so it's, 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 it's not easy. So I'm just gonna provide a very summary kind of uh, looking at different lines of evidence that we can use for that. Just first, a, a small example, uh, very in inspirational for me and, 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 and a seminal study of a palace kitchen. By Liesl account, and also collaboration with Jason Yeager, who was excavating this entire palatial complex here in uh, the northern side of uh, the site core of uh, Shunantunich, a very famous site in Western Belize. Uh, and uh, so Lacan's work in this kind of inconspicuous section of, of this palace um, led uh, her to identify uh, through amazing work, especially with the ceramics, uh, what was the kitchen for the, the, this entire palace. Interestingly, you can even see here the small stairs that lead to this passageway to bring food that was probably being consumed, um, not just inside those buildings, but uh, for larger events in the courtyard. Uh, it should be mentioned that we don't have a good idea necessarily of how the Maya ate um, in these, in, in these uh, circumstances. Maybe they were putting some mats around and sitting on the ground to eat. Maybe they were mostly sitting around the courtyard and these steps. Um, I suspect they, they, they had a lot of wooden furniture. It would probably probably benches and stools and even, who knows, low tables, whatnot. We have no clue. 
you don't really have evidence for all this wooden furniture that has perished. Uh, but uh, we don't fully understand how they were uh, eating in, in these courtyards. Uh, but I have a lot more evidence from, from my, my dissertation work at La Corona uh, from 2012 to 2016, 17. And here's the, the, the map of La Corona made by Marshall Canuto recently, uh, thanks to the LIDAR survey. And um, here the, uh, to the west of the main plaza of the site is the Regal Palace, uh, which I had the incredible privilege of working in. With a group of amazing uh, Guatemalan archaeologists, excavators, and collaborators from all around. Uh, this is a big team effort. My, my investigations focus uh, on the northern section of this palace. Um, and so, um, looking specifically at uh, these, the, 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 these probably uh, eight different buildings. And so, um, I got to make a cool little 3D model where I cut the roofs off so you can see inside of the rooms. Um, and then in addition um, to this really cool architecture uh, that I dug, it's, it, the architecture was the, probably the, the focus of my, my work, I've obviously found a lot of artifacts uh, and features and so on. So we'll look at some of those. One of the things I found uh, a lot of uh, was trash um, uh, or refuse uh, that was all piled up in a set of minutes. I had a discussion with Daniela Triadan um, uh, just before I started looking for this, and she said, beware, you think you know where you're going to find it. Uh, you might not find it. Uh, we've been looking for minutes at uh, Aguateca for a while, and we didn't end up finding him. And I was, I'm pretty sure I know where I'm going to find one. And then um, lo and behold, uh, and kind of unfortunately for me, I found uh, like six minutes. Uh, so uh, the seven minutes really actually. And it was a lot. These are still being excavated today, um, especially this massive one here uh, that uh, basically... Uh, is three meters in thickness um, behind the Acropolis there. That's about itself eight meters high. This, the, the, this, the, these enormous minutes, of course, uh, are, uh, and then as they, as the palace kind of uh, closed down towards the end of the Terminal Classic, as the Royal Court really, really shrank, or shrunk, sorry, they ended up even using the sunken patio for, for, uh, for drop, dumping uh, the stuff they were uh, not using anymore. These minutes were replete. Uh, with the, all the elements indicative of, of feasts and everyday meal. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, it's hard to differentiate those at times. Yet there is no great evidence for individual commensal events uh, in any of those, which uh, are required by some archaeologists to argue for actual feasts uh, for using the uh, F word. In addition uh, to, of course, these massive feasts, uh, sorry, the, that was the wrong word, these massive middens, uh, I uh, uh, found uh, I, I led a small program uh, funded by the National uh, Scientific Foundation um, called the Multi Proxy Program, looking uh, sampling every square meter of these um, these patios and several uh, areas of this group as well to um, look both at uh, do, do flotation studies to find micro artifacts and microbotanical remains, but also uh, trace elements, which we'll see what that is. And so we found lots of cool micro artifacts. We can see here a general distribution of density where we found most of these. Not unsurprisingly, a lot of them came from the area here that was reused as a midden, but we can also see uh, them clustering in this section here. Um, the botanical remains uh, were found as well as part of this program, carbonated botanical remains, which are ancient. And um, uh, we can see how they're clustered here in a very different pattern. Interestingly, uh, very few here, but a lot of them in front of this kitchen. I've published this material uh, in different places. And uh, also uh, trace elements, which was uh, perhaps the most complex of, of, of the data sets to look at. Here we see one of the statistical analyses I made of those uh, clearly showing that this area was particularly important for various activities. There are lots of walking paths along this area. Um, that's what uh, a lot of these, uh, all these elements here were incorporated in this statistical, in this factor that I was just showing. So. Uh, it's summarizing a lot of different uh, things that are going on, uh, but pretty cool stuff um, that I, I won't bore you with right now. Um, anyhow, what this all these this, this complex multi proxy data set indicated was that this area here with this perishable architecture, semi perishable architecture that that was dwarfed by these massive masonry buildings, was uh, definitely used uh, for ancillary functions, uh, most notably uh, cooking, and then trashing stuff afterwards, and also for storing a lot of food and vessels and things like that. Uh, 
This is what we tried to recreate here with artist Aaron Alfano, um, amazing artist from Ontario, Canada, who worked on the minus for the two first issues. Uh, and uh, with him, we try to recreate these activities that was detected that were detected with this program, um, and in particular here, butchering of animals and cooking and storage here and there and there and there, uh, and some dumping of the ashes that contains the. Uh, um, carbonized macrobotanical remains in front of the kitchen. We really found out a lot of cool stuff, even where they were placing braziers to eliminate nighttime, this area. Uh, we see middens that are starting to accumulate here and there. So um, a lot of interesting stuff, but all related to the, 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 the preparation of the food, not its actual consumption. So basically this group was associated if we want to remain within the, the theme of commensality and food preparation. Meanwhile, this massive, uh, beautifully built uh, rural courtyard was a, obviously a highly political space, which it was adjoin, adjoining a massive kitchen. Okay, so um, you can probably see where I'm going. Uh, within this, area, this, this, this space were specific different areas of different categories that seem to have been associated at least with communication. Uh, but I think, uh, and, and, and I think the arguments are pretty solid also for consuming stuff. Uh, these were decorated uh, with an amazing, uh, amazing, amazing art created by classic uh, Maya artists. Uh, a lot of it relates to the uh, incredible history that entangled La Corona as a site with uh, its uh, overlords uh, of the Kanul kingdom, uh, based in Spanche and and, and uh, further north in Mexico. Um, but that's for, for a different topic. Um, and so one, um, uh, and, and this, uh, we're zooming into this, this building, which, uh, sorry, we're now standing basically where that guy is standing, looking that way. And we're looking at the front of this building that is lacking its, its facade. And this, this was this massive stage fronting this, this big building. Uh, this red step here was actually a hieroglyphic step that was destroyed by looters. Fortunately, we, we did salvage a few monuments. Uh, look a bit like this. This is a very um, liberal uh, drawing that my father created uh, for representing what it might have looked like in the past. This was clearly an inspiration from the Homo Frieze, recreated by Alexander Tukovini uh, and discovered by Francisco Estrabelli and his team. And we see this, this, this beautiful space and, and stage literally fronting this large courtyard that could easily have. Uh, accommodated four or 500 people. And so this is kind of this massive stage where you can have people on top talking to people at the bottom, uh, also uh, people eating at the top, people eating at the bottom. Uh, and so creating again, this kind of diacritical situation. And then there were these, these benches, these exterior benches that are fronting a small space here and a much bigger space here um, that, were, that created these kind of semi-private settings where you can have someone sitting on these benches. This is what we're looking at. This is where one of the, the two of these beautiful uh, monuments were found, 55 and 56. And you can have some three, four people sitting on a bench, more people standing or sitting in front and uh, creating these kind of smaller intimate spaces, but still kind of visible um, to a lot of people standing around. And uh, of these two large private audience chambers uh, that, uh, or, um, that could have accommodated um, over a dozen people uh, sitting on these massive C-shaped uh, benches. Uh, and this one in particular, uh, this, this, the, the neighboring one, room three, was mostly destroyed by looters, unfortunately. But this one was, was spared uh, mostly, although we can see some looting damage in the middle of the bench there. Uh, this is where we found uh, element uh, 59. Uh, that is, was, that's its, its paint preserved, really cool stuff. We also found some cool uh, terminal classic polychrome there. And so um, this is exactly the kind of room that we have been looking at that are represented on some of these vessels here uh, from Kerr 2914. Uh, interestingly, um, we can see the, 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 the scene here where this, I believe this is a wedding negotiation, a marriage negotiation scene. We see uh, a lot of um, offerings and tribute items that are presented to a king. And um, there's some beverages that are being drank as well. Um, and what I just did uh, before this talk, I thought it would be fun to actually put the, uh, the, the profile, the elevation uh, that I did of this room against this, this, uh, this vessel, which is it's, it's, it's kind of striking the, um, the similarity between this, these two spaces. They just fit perfectly. It's pretty cool. Anyhow, this is looking into this room from the front. And so, and then I had some um, 
some also some geochemical studies done uh, which indicated through phosphorus and potassium that this bench was probably used for consuming but also the platform and perhaps the steps which is interesting people sitting in the steps and the edge of the platform here the, the, the court chart as well and so uh, what we're looking at and i, I suspect is, is here two ends two complementary ends of this commensal spectrum where you can see people where, where people are cooking and preparing and uh, just dealing with all that and serving. Uh, I didn't mention this room here, which was the only way to transition from both uh, from one side to the other, allowing to control a lot of this um, stuff, and then uh, a place for eating and talking and so on. So basically, uh, commensality and communication is a lack or a court um, uh, having at least in, in three different settings: semi-public stage, uh, limited audience stages as those benches, and these private audiences for gathering diverse groups of distinct size sizes to share food and information. Uh, obviously, um, using the concept of diacritical feasting is useful here. And um, creates, a, obviously, a very political uh, situation associated with asymmetrical reciprocity between people offering uh, tribute or taxes or information in exchange uh, for uh, prestige, um, paraphernalia, regalia, and also information. Um, as well between uh, members of the court, uh, the allies and vassals. We, it's hard to get to exactly what's happening, but these, these, these polychrome scenes help us understand what's going on here. So basically feasts, uh, I think of them as a communicational uh, technology or communication tools as ways to gather people to speak. And you can use uh, fun beverages and drugs, fun food uh, to get them to talk a little more. Um, and so I, I, Take this quote again here saying that feasts appear to have been widespread across social groups so not just um, not just for the elite but this is something that's happening across all segments of society creating all these uh, reciprocal situations um, and um, so domestic and other kinds of middens um, are represent a mix of regular and extraordinary commensal events it's sometimes impossible to differentiate them uh, commensal politics centered around feasts uh, were obviously central elements of all ancient Maya households, including rural ones. They facilitated the reproduction of political economies and sovereignty. They articulated various segments of the sociopolitical spectrum through asymmetrical reciprocal rapports. And I hope that people can think of feasts in, in more um, in new ways that are not only tied to specific events and specific assemblages of our artifacts. And it hopefully becomes now a fine word, not just one that we should not speak of in public. And so I'm, I'm quoting myself here from, from my dissertation, but I, I like this, this idea with, with to imagine what feasts were going, what feasts implied. So with reception areas fully engaged in commensal politics and audience chambers crowded with nobles, stages busy with performances, storehouses and passageways packed with goods and attended by administrators and ancillary buildings in full use, palaces were at their busiest. This can apply, be applied to any uh, homes that we have uh, and Think of a house, a family house during a, a Christmas celebration, but also, of course, uh, ancient Maya households of, of, of during um, harvest season. This is everywhere. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, uh, everyone, for listening to my talk and uh, to Hari uh, for organizing the conference, to Mary Kate for her help with multiple points here, and to my advisor, uh, doctoral advisor, Marcel Cunito, and uh, the co director of the lab. A project, Tomas Parientos, for supporting my research. Many colleagues, the amazing workers uh, we work with, uh, who are really our archaeologists uh, in Guatemala, and to the Instituto de Antropología y Historia de Guatemala. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Merci. Excellent talk. Um, we now have time for uh, questions and comments. So far, there aren't any at the QA, but uh, the floor is yours. And I think we have max now time because uh, the next talk is uh, quarter past, right? So we have 25 minutes, uh, including a short break, I would imagine. Matt raised hand. What does that mean? I, I don't know if he wants to talk. It's kind of funny because as I was speaking, he, he went outside to get the food that uh, Priscilla got us, but he got locked outside of the building because he doesn't oh, have- he's asking, can time. you let me so in? Yeah, yeah, I will. I will, Matt. I'll let you in, but just wait up. Uh, you should have taken my card. <laughs> okay, there's one question. Any indication of uh, toilets? Toilets. Yes. That's that's a whole 
other debate. There was a really, there was a glorious uh, moment at the Belize Archaeology Symposium a few years ago where uh, different ceramicists started talking about that. I think the idea is that they were using probably concepts like some things similar to chamber pots, basically, uh, during those uh, inside palaces, at least, and inside these kinds of settings to, uh, to, to, to it would be convenient to just do it in, in, in a pot to then take the pot away and, and dump it somewhere else. That there's lots of ideas that the human waste uh, would have been used as well as, as fertilizers for gardens and things like that. And so, but yeah, there's a few kind of toilet-like things. I've, the most convincing one is in Tonina, I've seen. Uh, but yeah, they didn't have like running water or things like that. So it's definitely, a, and I'm, I'm sure outhouses and, and things like that existed. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But yeah, that's uh, something that they didn't represent on polychrome vases. Yeah, so far no glyphs on saying anything, anything like that. Uh, I'm just distracted here because Matt sent another, another message. Harry would never leave me out in the cold. <laughs> um, there's another question. Uh, is the 3D model available online to view or download? Uh, the model itself for navigating and everything, no, I haven't made it available online itself, but there's multiple, uh, it's been, it's in my dissertation, uh, so you can see it there. No, I haven't made the, the whole thing available to, um, uh, yeah, I don't, sorry, apologize. Um, I, Max, I have a question slash comment. You, you were quoting uh, Catherine Twist saying something on the lines of uh, feasting is deeply and inherently political. At least to me, this sounds really depressing. And, and I'm wondering if she or you have looked at the commensality from the point of view of different actors involved in these feasts. Um, well, that is, I'm sure, surely uh, for the organizers and key figures, it was probably political. Uh, but uh, what about all the other participants, including the common people who were in various cultures taking, parts, uh, taking part in these events? So I'm, I'm merely wondering uh, if mm -hmm. anthropology and archaeology is making, again, everything political and ritual when it could have just been enjoying a meal and drink with friends, like you said at the beginning of your talk. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that to a certain degree, um, I mean, politics here being like being used in the broadest sense right but even like as if like if you if you read a bit of the literature um, on on concepts of debt or or reciprocity even if um Hari, you and i uh go for a meal somewhere uh, or, or invite a few friends over and one of us decides to pay for, for the meal that in and of itself is a political act which is weird to think about it this way but it is in some way shape or form because it creates a certain um, again asymmetry in terms of reciprocity um, that may imply for example that the next time you pay or like uh, or if, if you and i start a tradition where uh, you pay i pay you pay i pay and one day i decide to pay twice in a row that's weird. Like it sort of means that we stop this tradition. So there, the, the, this is kind of where it's getting that everything can be political. And here I'm kind of pulling out some stuff out of my Graeber hat. Um, uh, but um, however, for your first point, uh, Catherine Twist actually is what that's what she she's she's kind of uh, talking about a lot is the fact that we can think of these events from multiple perspectives, and so multiple agents may have multiple approaches, understanding, and uh, emotions associated with these different feasts. Um, I think that if a commoner participates um, or travels to a town to, to participate in a festival that's hosted by the, 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 the king of that town or whatever, um, it is in of itself a certain political move because you're allowed to freely go there, you participate, and there, there, there's, there's, there are certain political things that are involved in this, but it's not necessarily overly political. And so, and then However, what she says is it's the reason why classifying feasts in specific categories, uh, like um, diacritical, but there's other categories that I haven't mentioned, but like patron role feasts uh, or aggrandizing feasts um, is tricky because uh, that varies uh, by, um, by who you're talking about. Maybe people have different perspectives on it. People have different intentions. Going so classifying them in that way can indeed uh, lead anthropologists and archaeologists to maybe miss the picture. Uh, so, so yeah, um, but I, I like to think kind of one of my, my emphasis here was that, you know, these feasts were regular practices and they were, they were um, consciously used, I think, 
uh, by political regime to gather people at court uh, to really speak with them. This was the only way at the time where there was no um, postal service uh, or texting or e mass emails to, 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 to um, uh, present information to a whole group of people. Uh, I think you needed to get them at the same place uh, regularly. And I think uh, these events would have been, uh, if you just say, come, come tomorrow, uh, is maybe I won't come, but come tomorrow and I'll give you some really delicious uh, poke. Uh, that, that might help, uh, that would help you, Hari, it would help you get there, I know that. Yeah, this is, this is interesting also. Um, yesterday I watched the documentary uh, it was about the Hallstatt culture 2,500 years ago. And they were saying similar things like all feasting at this time uh, was political and served a purpose of uh, cementing alliances and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like with, in Hallstatt culture, you're basing all these arguments on archaeology. So I'm just wondering where this comes from. So and general, making vast generalization is, is always tough. But I think we can say that there's a political element in all feasts. It just might not be what we think of as political uh, from mm -hmm. kind of the, 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 the common use of the term. The, there's a political statement from uh, Matt in the chat saying, I think that it's best that Max pays for our meals from now on. I hate politics. <laughs> He's getting cold, I think. <laughs> um, I think there's in the chat, let's see. Yeah, there's, uh, there's another uh, comment question. Ricardo, hi, thank you for a great presentation. I was wondering if there is evidence for feasts around specific functions, funerals, weddings, coronations, religious festivals, political negotiations, either in polychrome basis or architecture and so forth. Well, um, yes, there's that. Well, often it's not mentioned that feasts were occurring at these uh, kind of uh, seasonal celebrations and so on, but it's assumed. Uh, uh, or during the celebration of patron deities and so on. We know people were gathering. We have evidence for feasting associated with temples and things like that, uh, or, or visitations of temples even, uh, that clearly indicate that this is the case. We have uh, also all kinds of, is beyond feasting during these festivals, many things happen, processions and so on, theater. Uh, um, but uh, obviously people need to eat when you get them somewhere. And then that's where, but I think these would have been more, more the fair kind I was mentioning earlier, where you need to, to get a lot, like kind of a lot of cheap food and cheap drinks for a lot of people at the same time. And I don't think that stuff would have been prepared in the kind of kitchens that it was in the palace. It's different kind of uh, settings for that. Um, but yeah, there's def I mean, there's, there has to be uh, an association between these. And if we look at the uh, uh, comparative literature uh, that documents these kinds of things for Western uh, uh, medieval world, for example, or uh, in you know, medieval India and so on, we do have evidence for that. Uh, so there's no reason that a society that was pretty much medieval, like classic Maya society, uh, didn't have these. Uh, it's just uh, um, has to be the case. Thank you again, Max. Um, I think you need to let Matt in and uh, we have 15 minutes before Shanti's talk so I think we are going to have a 15 minute break Max 15 minute break yeah cool perfect all right so see you in 15